Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us on our webinar, Top 10 Upgrade Mistakes. A few points to note before we get started. Today's presentation is one way, therefore the presenters cannot hear your comments. If you do have questions, please type them into the question box rather than the chat panel. Questions will be answered after the webinar has concluded. You may minimise the GoToMeeting panel by clicking the red arrow button. So today's speakers are Michael Lane and Sue Whitaker. Michael Lane is a managing consultant at Claremont. Michael is responsible for Claremont's R12 upgrade and fusion application services, guiding clients along their upgrade roadmaps. Sue Whitaker has worked for Insight Software for 12 years as a product specialist and assists customers to get the maximum benefits out of Insight. So without further ado, over to you Michael. Good morning everybody. So a brief uh, look at the agenda, this is the, the, uh, the stuff we're going to be covering. Um, the idea of this, of this presentation is to highlight some of the areas that customers generally get wrong when they're approaching their upgrades and the things that you can do to avoid those and we'll certainly be focusing heavily on the things you need to consider before you start your upgrade, which, which is where a lot of the mistakes get made. So just having a quick look at the, the agenda, we'll have a look at the, the list of the success factors that you need to have in mind when you're approaching your upgrade starting points and targets, where you're, what version do you want now, where are you going to, how to scope your upgrade so you don't miss anything out, what customers tend to forget in that area, especially uh, scoping is a particularly good one for forgetting stuff, how to approach your customizations and where, where things go wrong in that area, uh, similarly for trial upgrades, how to make sure that your, uh, your final live upgrade will, will be on time and will be as close to 100% accurate as you can get it. We'll look at the, the, the challenges of reporting in release 12 and how that's different from 11i and we'll also be looking at the inside reporting software in that area and then finally we're going to consider <coughs> the impact of the upgrade on the wider business which is certainly an area that generally gets forgotten in people's people's view of this, this, this being a technical upgrade only. A quick introduction to Claremont in case you haven't heard of us uh, we're an Oracle consulting outfit, um, originally known as Premier Tech. We rebranded as Claremont at the beginning of last year. Um, we originally specialised in areas around lease management, real estate management and asset management. Um, that's broadened out now into, a, into the, the wider financials, HR, payroll, supply chain areas where we offer implementations, upgrades, as well as the whole managed services arm as well. I won't spend an awful lot of time on this. If you, if you want any more information about Claremont, do please get in touch. And a very brief overview of some of our customers. Now, this slide I'm going to get off as quickly as possible, mainly because it's got my picture on it. Um, just, I, Amy's done a very good introduction of me, but just to, to set the scene a bit, I've been doing e-business suite for about 18 years and doing upgrades on e-business suite from release nine. So a lot of the challenges that people face now with release 12 upgrading to it are no different to, to when I first started doing upgrades 18 years ago, um, which is both surprising and not at the same time, I guess. Now, the success, sorry, the success factors when you're, when you're approaching your upgrade. Now this is um, the high level view. We're going to get into detail on these in the, in the following slides. Certainly like I've already mentioned, scope, absolutely key. The areas of customizations and trial upgrades and business impact, we're, we're, these are probably the, the three or four top ones that we're going we're to focus on. Now, top ten mistakes. These will be explained in a little bit more detail as we go forward, but um, just to sort of, in, a, in, a, in, the, in a, the view of, tell you what I'm going to tell you, top one, underestimating the scope of the whole project. Now, this one and two kind of go together in this area. The, the most common mistake that people make is assuming that the, a, an upgrade to release 12 is a purely technical thing and they can leave it to the IT department to get on with. This is not true. There is, this is, this is my view, there is no such thing as a technical upgrade to release 12 because it does make changes to the, to the end user experience, certainly in the financials areas. Looking down the list, number three, ignoring the wider business impact. Now, because it's not just a technical upgrade, you have to take into account how the new behaviour of the application is going to affect your end users. 
and people can, if not ignore that completely, at least don't don't give it the, um, the weight that it, that it certainly needs. Again, number four, assuming that you can just leave IT to get on and, and do this. IT need to work hand in hand with the rest of the business delivering these upgrades. Otherwise, you won't get the upgrade you want, and you certainly won't get a system that you think you've tested thoroughly. Um, number five is a more technical challenge, misunderstanding the release 12 data model. When we come on to talk about customization upgrades a little bit later, I will, I'll share with you a, uh, a story where we got caught out, a uh, previous company I used to work for, doing an upgrade and where changes in the release 12 data model appear to make, your, to make you believe that your customizations are actually working successfully when in fact they're not. The, the sixth one there, um, again it's kind of coming back to this business impact thing, you, have, you assume that release, it, release 12 business processes are unaffected by the upgrade, but if you use if you use financials, tax, payables, those kind of areas, anything to do with subledger accounting, that is most definitely not the case. And following on from that, because there are those changes in the way the application behaves, what people fail to do, <coughs> or don't do enough of, is allowing themselves time to revisit their testing scripts. So you may, you may be a very well organized client, and unfortunately not all of you are like this, um, and have a series of test scripts which work on your current application, you need to allow a reasonable amount of time to rewrite those, or at least reread re them, to, to make sure they, f they fit with release 12 functionality. So aligned with that, you need to allow yourself some time to actually work out how release 12 behaves differently to release 11. Number eight, expectations that release 12 is a lot better than release 11. Like. It is a better product, but not massively so, and I might get sued for that one by Oracle, but I'll take that risk. Um, reporting especially is an area where it is as complicated as it was in, in 11i, although technically more proficient in some areas, which is where software such as Insight would be able to help you. Um, number nine, expectations and communications, which sounds one of these obvious points that, that people do tend to forget. Because you can't expect the IT department to deliver this thing in isolation, there does need to be a good level of communication around when this upgrade is expected to happen, what the impact on the business is, and whose, whose staff in the various departments are going to be seconded to work on the upgrade project if, if you're going to take that approach. Um, getting that code message out very early as possible will definitely help you. The tenth point there is another semi-technical one. If you're integrating your business suite with other systems, you do have to look at the way the APIs and the open interfaces operate. They don't change hugely, but they do change. So um, the, the mistake of assuming that your, your third party payroll system will integrate with release 12 HR or uh, third party financial systems um, is a common one. Um, so it's worth getting the manuals out and looking at the way that these, uh, the APIs now, now function. Okay, starting point. Um, ideally, you want to get to the latest release that's available to you, which currently is 12.13. You can get to that if you're running 11.59 or later. Most people now are running 11.5.10, but I know of a couple of sites where people are still running releases earlier than 11.59. If that's the case, in your organisation, you can't go to release 12.1. You have to do an 11 by 10 upgrade first, and then upgrade. The second point on here, which modules and functions are being used? Now, the point here is that this is not the same as the modules you've got licences for. Again, this is where you've got this sort of division of understanding between IT and the business. IT can look at the system and go, well, we're licensed for AR, GL, order management, and whatever but actually which parts of those modules are being used in the business. It won't impact the actual technical part of the upgrade because eBusiness Suite will upgrade the whole thing regardless of who's using it and which bits they're using. Uh, one of the, the joys of eBusiness Suite, the data model is you get it all regardless of what they're using. However, looking at from the other end, the users may only be using AR, for example, to record customers' names and addresses, the invoicing and the ordering may be done by third-party systems. So this is going to 
inform how you plan your testing and any retraining that's required as a result of the upgrade. So it's really not just a case of what have I got, it's what have I got and how am I using it. Similarly, how is the system being used? This is more from a technical perspective. If you're running, let's say, order management um, on a sort of a high OLTP, which is online transaction processing, which means you're pumping through a large number of transactions in business day, then you've got to consider your performance testing when you, when you do your first trial upgrade. Similarly, you may be doing batch, a lot of batch processing. If you're heavy on the manufacturing side, we have seen customers where revisions to bonds, for example, in the manufacturing suite will be uploaded overnight. You may be in a situation, if you're a, a larger organization, where you're running both of those things. So you do need to, it's, you do need to take into account how you test the thing from a performance perspective. Um, Release 12 is a little bit heavier in terms of the load on the servers than 11i. The difference is not massive. However, you do need to make sure you factor that testing in. It does get missed out on a large number of occasions. On that performance note, the last point there on the slide, how well does it currently perform? This is going, going back to a point I made earlier about scoping the project. Are you going to need to address any performance problems that you're your system has now as part of your upgrade. Are people expecting the upgrade to make it all better? And if you're not planning on doing that, you need to tell them you're not planning on doing that. Again, the point 10 on the, the mistakes list, communication. Um, it's, you, you may well have to end up doing a database upgrade as part of your, of your application upgrade, in which case you've got an opportunity there to take, take advantage of some new features in the, the latest release of the database. You may already have upgraded the database for 11, 5, 10, um, but it's always worth looking at that area. Certainly when Claremont go and do these upgrade assessments, we, we run a set of scripts which assess the performance of the database as well as how far you customise the application, and that certainly will introduce some things into scope as part of the upgrade project. Now, target versions. Like I mentioned, you want to try and get to the latest one available, which uh, as of now is 12.13 you actually can't upgrade to 1213, you have to go to 12.1 and then you apply these things called RUPs, which are patches that put the point release, the final point release on to the roll-up patches. 12.2, as most of you are probably aware, is due out sometime soon, although Oracle have been very cagey about when it's going to be. Now, the difference between 12.1 and 12.2 is largely technical. The main difference being a new application server, so the WebLogic servers that Oracle bought a few years ago will become the application servers in 12.2. Functionally though, the big differences are between 11i and 12.1. The move to 12.2 does not significantly change the functionality. The point being, there isn't much in the way of business value to be gained for waiting, by waiting rather, for, for 12.2. Bearing in mind, if you're sat on 11.5.10 now, your D support date is November next year, so you need to start thinking about how much time you've got. Hanging around for 12.2 is not going to do anything. Yeah. Now, scoping. This is the one area which always causes problems because you get to an end of an upgrade project and look back and think, well, we blew the budget, we blew the timeline. Why did we do that? And these are some of the most common areas that cause that, that kind of a problem. The top one, I keep repeating myself on this point, but the customers assume that it's a technical upgrade um, and that there is not much in the way of business impact. Um, when they get partway through the upgrade project, they realise, oh, hang on, we've got a new tax module, and suddenly so have to second a bunch of people from finance to go and look at how tax now works in release 12. You start to see the budget and the timeline increasing. So understanding what your scope is going to be before you start is absolutely key. So some of the common areas, customization, certainly, we're going to come on to those in a bit more detail in a couple of slides time. Thinking about your architecture, um, will it support release 12? Is your operating system certified for release 12? Is your hardware nearing the end of life? You may want to consider hardware refresh as part of the project. Trial upgrades, um, I generally recommend about uh, usually at least three trial upgrades as part of the project to be, it's all about minimising risk. We will talk about trial upgrades in a bit more detail later. But that's certainly, you need to factor that into planning. 
Coming back to the testing, like I mentioned, you'll, you'll want to revisit your testing scripts. If you haven't got any testing scripts, you'll certainly want to make sure you allow plenty of time in writing those. And any training. Now, you're not going to have to sort of do comprehensive retraining for your end users, but certainly those users who operate in finance, certainly if they're looking at areas such as tax or supplier management, that those areas change quite a lot. Certainly for the supplier management, the, the, the screens move from the professional forms to the HTML. And it looks quite different. The last point on there, resources. Now, when you're planning your upgrade, the things to consider, are you going to be able to do this using your own resources? If you've got the skills in-house, fantastic. But bear in mind, you're taking people away from their normal business as usual roles, their day jobs, to work on your project. So who's going to do that role whilst they're off upgrading the system? This is an area which is almost always underestimated, um, particularly in areas such as finance and DBA, if, you, if your own DBAs are going to run the project. Supporting the upgrade environments, and there will be more than one, as well as your own system, your current production system and whatever non-prod environments you've got supporting that tends to put a fairly hefty workload on people. So bear that in mind with the planning. And the very last point on there, make sure someone signs this thing off. Your IT, the business, sitting down together, this is what the upgrade is going to deliver. Is everyone on on the same message, on the same page? That's that's very important. So when you're planning your upgrade, when you're scoping it, this is the some of the things that people most like are most likely to forget or at least underestimate. Custom code. Now, custom code can exist in a number of different places and certainly a common area of things being overlooked are those bits of code which sit outside of your business suite. Certainly anything that sits in the, at the operating system level, so if you've got shell scripts sitting on your Unix box or other code running on Windows servers or network servers, then those are very easy to overlook because they don't pop up, they don't become visible in the e-business suite. People tend to concentrate on their customised concurrent programmes, their customised forms, any additional menus they've added, um, and that's all good, but you've got to remember that you can quite easily have a load of code set outside the system. Upgrading financials customizations, the data model changes an awful lot between 11 and 12 in finance. Um, so people generally don't give themselves enough time to upgrade their finance customizations. Thinking about your servers and your disk space for the trial upgrades. You are going to have probably at any one time two release 12 environments running prior to actually doing the live upgrade. So you want to make sure you've got space and power to run those environments alongside any production and non-production 11i that you're running at the moment. The test scripts, I've mentioned this, but it's worth re going over again because it is one that people tend to forget. You make sure you allow yourself a good few weeks to go through your test scripts and have a look at release 12 and how the testing is going to be effective. Testing in general, now this is a kind of a symptom of assuming it's just a technical upgrade. When you're planning the testing, you are, the people who will be doing it for you are generally not in the IT department. So you need to plan for time from guys from finance or HR or order processing to come and spend some time doing testing, analysing the results, and then retesting when whatever problems you've come up with uh, have been fixed. Integration testing, like I mentioned, some of the points of integration into a business suite do change. There are, in fact, more of them now in, the, in 12 than there were in 11, so you may want to consider um, integrating systems that you don't already have, but be very careful. Um, it's very tempting uh, for people to start pulling all sorts of tasks into the upgrade project because it seems like a good opportunity to do it. You want to be able to manage these things in fairly small, uh, tightly controlled blocks. So if you want to introduce new features like new interfaces or even new functionality, that's great. Get the upgrade done first and bolt those on afterwards with your the backfill, this is back to resourcing again, if you're going to be borrowing people from finance, who's going to be doing their job in the back in the finance department? Um, customers and consultancies alike make the same mistake that you can 
probably take 50% of someone's time. It hardly ever works. That time on an upgrade project will always creep up above 75, and it normally gets close to 100, certainly on DBA users. The final point on there, and it does, it, it seems obvious, but people do manage to overlook this. If you've got related Oracle software, that Discoverer is the example I've put on there, but there are other, other examples like identity management applications, you have to be have to be certain that you're going to be running a version that's compatible with release 12. So you may want you may have to include the upgraded Disco in your in your plan, or any of the other Oracle applications that uh, you may be running. Right, customizations. Now, most most customers that I visit don't actually know how many customizations they have, which it it, it sounds odd, although. When you consider all the places you can hide custom code within any business suite, and as I mentioned, outside of it, on the operating system, it's actually not that surprising. I mean, just the example I put on there, SQL validated value sets. Because the data model is changing in certain areas, and you, you need to be able to find all the places where custom SQL statements exist, and change them, if necessary, to work with release 12, there are some fairly hidden away places where you have to go and, f and, you have to go and look. Value sets is one that gets overlooked. Um, you can also use SQL statements to default profile option values, um, and they're very easily hidden. Um, we, we tend to use a, uh, an assessment kit which integrates those for interrogates the database to find those things. Um, but it's, it's certainly something that gets very, very easily overlooked. So, for upgrading the customizations, does, somebody, does anyone actually use the thing? I mean, a lot of the business suite systems have been there for a number of years, they've been upgraded through. 9, 10, 11, now they're going to 12. Customizations have been created, very rarely get taken out. They just get left sitting on the bottom of someone's menu or someone's just checked, you know, unchecked the enabled box in the uh, concurrent program definition screen. It's still sat there. Um, so actually go and ask someone if they're actually still using these. The concurrent manager is quite useful here because depending on how often you purge it, you can see when concurrent programs were actually last run. So you can then go and use that to challenge the users. Just, you know, we, can we take any of these in the scope? Does it work properly in the current version? This is one you need to be very careful of. If you've got problems with a customization 11i, the users are going to assume that release 12 will fix it. If you don't know about those problems, you can't fix it. Or you may be assuming that uh, that's someone else's problem to do, or you're going to do that after the upgrade. It's, it's a question of scope, and it's a question of communication. This next point is the one where I, uh, I got caught out on a project a couple of years ago. Um, you have to watch out for these. The way that Oracle upgrades its data model, this um, this area where we had a problem was in the subledger accounting model. When you upgrade it, the the data that 11i uses, as it links between general ledger and subledgers, stays in place. But release 12 uses a whole set of new tables and columns to perform the same function. So what happens is you've got a custom report that is looking at the, the link between subledgers and general ledger in release 11. You run it pre-upgrade, you run it post-upgrade, the values look the same, everyone's happy, you move on. Several weeks later, when you get to system testing or UAT, and one of the finance users pipes up and says, um, I've put a whole load of new um, invoices through payables, and they're not showing up on this report. It's then you realise oh, the data's not in those take those columns anymore. Um, it's it's uh, mildly embarrassing to say the least. So do watch out for that kind of stuff. Oracle is not very tidy when it comes to uh, moving the data around. So just to summarise that at the end, there's there are functional changes that will impact the, the data model and obviously has an impact on your customizations. Subledger accounting, as I've mentioned, also supplier data moves across to the trading community architecture in the same way that customer data did in the last release. So beware of that. Just a general point on customizations. Um, we always tend to advise people to take them out wherever you can. And an upgrade is an excellent opportunity to do this because you're going to have to assess each of these anyway just to make sure that A, someone's using it, and B, does it work, and C, how the hell do I upgrade it? If you're going to do that, then look at it from the point of view of the release 12 features. Could you use something new in release 12? Or in the case of a whole 
raft of Oracle reports customizations, could you move them to BI Publisher, for example, which is a lot easier to use? Um, like I say, uh, the, the upgrade is a very good opportunity to do this. Um, it will save you an awful lot of time and effort in the future if you can remove as many customizations as you possibly can, obviously without upsetting the users too much. Okay, um, practicing the upgrades. Carrying out trial upgrades, generally we advise people to do, do this at least three times. The, there's two main reasons for doing trial upgrades. The first one is the upgrade will break at some point. When you, when you run these things, it spawns a number of workers and off they go, moving your data around into the new data model. At various points, the workers will encounter errors which you need to go and investigate and fix. And generally, that's what your first trial upgrade will give you, um, is a view of all the problems that you've got. You can then put scripted fixes together or automatic fixes together, which you can then you then run in your second and third trial upgrades. The, uh, the value of the, the, the upgrades two and three is really to do with getting the timing right. Um, generally, customers will want to upgrade their systems over a weekend, so we tend to take these things down on a Friday night, and we aim to have them back up by Monday or Tuesday at the latest. Obviously, you want to minimise the impact on, on business as usual. So, doing it three times will give you some confidence that you can hit the window. If you can do, certainly the last trial upgrade on some hardware which is equivalent or close to the spec of your live system, then um, that's great. That will increase your the level of confidence. This is all about trying to reduce the risk of the live upgrade. There are some practical considerations on, on doing these upgrades. I, I think I probably mentioned these a number of times already, but you've got to make sure you've got spare hardware to run these trial upgrade environments on. Who's going to manage them? Are you going to use your own DBAs? Are you going to call on someone like Claremont or another organisation to come, in, to come and help you out here? Uh, like I say, people will try and get away with using part of the DBA's time to support a, an upgrade project. Uh, time will always creep up, um, certainly sort of above 70, 75%, so be wary of that. Reporting in release 12, I mean this comes back to one of the common mistakes I mentioned right at the, the start, that people expect release 12 to be an awful lot better than release 11i. Um, in some ways it is better, in the reporting arena, it is, depending on your perspective, as complicated or as powerful as it was in 11i, in that you still have a wide variety of tools in the system to do reporting, like Oracle Reports, you've got BI Publisher, you've got the FSGs, Discoverer, and the increasing amount of dashboards that are becoming available in the various modules. Um, those are very good products if you're of a technical mind. BI Publisher is it's slightly easier to use, and more of the standard content gets put into the other machine release 12, which is which is a good move. Uh, certainly, from the display point of view, the the task of developing the report, it's a lot easier to do it in BI Publisher because you can do it in Microsoft Word or you can do it in a PDF document. Um, so IT get left with the task of generating an XML document, which can deliver all the data, but you can hand off the actual report design to to the end users. Um, one point about the upgrade, again, it's a very good opportunity to try and get yourself away from some of the dead-end um, reporting products that Oracle have got. Certainly reports and discoverer are not strategic reporting products for Oracle, which you can, you can tell by looking at their sort of business intelligence suites in that the enterprise edition of business intelligence does include BI Publisher, but there's no reports for discoverer. You have to, you have to buy standard edition for those. Um, so if you've got the opportunity to move away into BI Publisher or even BI Applications, if you've got the, the, um, the space and the extensive budget to, to buy that, then that's, that's another option for you. So it will be for, the, for the, the longer term future of your application and keeping an eye on the Fusion apps that are coming in, uh, that would be a very good move for you. But generally, you are going to face the same challenges reporting in release 12, as you did in 11i, with the additional complication, of course, that the data model changes. So if you're heavy on the finance side, you've got a reporting challenge. And there are new ways of accessing the data. You've got this um, multi-org access control. 
So if you do shared, if you're doing shared services, the way you report on data, certainly from the security perspective, is handled slightly differently. Final area, and I have we've touched upon this in various uh, various of the previous slides, but it's worth bearing in mind just before we end. I do sound like I'm repeating myself, but there is this this is not a purely technical upgrade. People do tend to view it like that because Oracle is uh, forcing you to upgrade. Eleven five ten is going to be desupported. Well, that's not strictly true. It's going to go out to extended support. You can still have uh, the the sustaining support if you want, but for a large number of companies that doesn't work because of the, the items it misses out. So they consider this to be a technical upgrade just to keep pace with the Oracle version numbers. But there are changes in release twelve which will impact your business especially in financials. If you're not heavy on the financial side, then you've got, you've got slightly less to worry about, although most customers that I, that I see have, have got some element of the financials side. So certainly there is a new tax module, which has a whole underlying uh, set of new tables for tax data, uh, the way the sub ledger accounting works changes, and um, you can certainly get caught out in that area because of the the challenges I mentioned about Oracle not being very tidy about changing its data model, and the supply management changes as well. That is, that is a challenge, and it is also quite a good opportunity because the TCA model that suppliers will now use is a lot more flexible than the previous the previous model. Um, so you can link up your suppliers and your customers if in fact you're one in the same company if you deal with very large organisations. So there are some there are some opportunities there as well. But for the people at the end user level who are managing these parts of your business, there will be some changes. So you do need to consider how are they going to help you test it? How are you going to train them to use the new system? And how much of that time are you going to have to backfill? And planning to do that, obviously you're going to have to continue your business on a day-to-day -day basis while these guys are off having fun doing an upgrade. So bear that in mind. There will be, um, if not a financial cost, there will certainly be a time, a time cost to your organisation trying to do that. Um, and the very last point on here, because of what I said at the beginning, and it, this being viewed as a purely technical upgrade, um, IT sometimes assume that they're just going on with it, and the rest of the business assume that IT are just getting on with it. But then you come to these areas like tax and suppliers, and you suddenly realise, hang on, we need there's something we need to sort out together. No one's planned any of that time, so you suddenly start looking at upgrade projects being stretched from a time perspective, for extra cost. Suddenly you might not bringing a whole bunch of contractors to work on this area because you don't have the in-house skill. Those are some of the the, 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 the opportunities to uh, to make mistakes when you communicate with the rest of the world. So just to run over these top ten again, hopefully we've covered these in a little bit more detail, but do feel free to ask questions if you if you, if you want any more detail on these. Um, the scope, absolutely number one at the top, the area where upgrades will most Go, most likely go wrong. This, which is not to say the upgrade won't be a success in the end, but it won't be as cheap or as quick as you thought, was misunderstanding what you actually have to put in the upgrade project. Um, so it's the technical side of the thing. Um, are you going to have to fix a load of problems that your, your application already has? Have you understood all, where all your customizations are? And is the rest of the business expecting this upgrade to make the, the e business suite world a whole lot better? If they are understanding, you better understanding. You better understand now why they think it isn't good at the moment, and uh, what you're going to have to deliver as part of that upgrade to, to give them that, that value thereafter. Understaffing again is is a, is a common mistake. Don't put enough. Don't backfill enough resources for the guys who work on the project. That's two or three kind of go together in that area. And there's a, there is a wider business impact because of tax and all the other stuff. Assuming that IT can work in isolation, you can't. The release 12 data model does change an awful lot, especially in financials. I, uh, I certainly got caught out of that once a few years ago, so uh, learn from my mistake certainly. Um, business processes will change, and which goes, which leads into number seven. You've got to re you've got to revisit how you're going to do your testing and certainly some training as well because of the way those things change. Don't assume everything's going to be a whole lot better in release 12 unless you put the effort in to make it a lot better, um, especially in the area of reporting. Manage your expectations. Tell people what you're going to do, what's in and out of scope of the upgrade. Get agreement, get sign off. And lastly, don't forget your other systems. E Business Suite um, 
integration points will change as part of part of this upgrade. And I think we've probably covered all of that, so we're going to just skip straight over it. Time for some questions. Great. Um, so yeah, question time. As, as Mike said, if you have any questions, then please do feel free to enter them into um, the question um, panel on the right side of your screen. We have had a couple of questions that have come in during the webinar. Is BI Publisher more of an IT staff tool? BI Publisher actually is, is actually split into two parts. Um, it's an effort on Oracle's part to make reporting easier for the end users in that the reporting template, the, the, the GUI part of it, if you like, is can be done by the, the end users in finance or HR because you can do it in, in Word. The IT staff still need to deliver the data and they, in, in BI Publisher you have to deliver it in, in XML format, but there are um, XML data templates that you can that you can use within Business Suite to allow you to do that. So you effectively just plug in a SQL statement to the XML template. It will uh, you tell it how you're going to group the output. So if you've got summarization parent child in the in the data, that will generate an XML document, and then the concurrent manager will merge that document with whatever templates the um, the users have come up with. And it's worth bearing in mind that you can have as many templates. On a, sitting on the front of a piece of XML as you like. So if you're running multi-language systems, um, then you could have your French, your English, your German, all running off the same base data. Uh, so it's it's not entirely an IT staff tool, though. I would say it's kind of split between staff and the uh, the business users. Great, thank you. And final question for you, Mike. Did you say you need to be on 11.5.9 or 11.5.10? to upgrade directly to R12? You can upgrade to 12 from 11.59. There's a very helpful document on, if you've got access to Metalink, um, there is an Oracle guide for planning and executing your upgrade, which which clarifies all of these points. So uh, 11.59 onwards can upgrade to release 12. Um, anything earlier than that, you'll need to get to 11.5.10 before you do your upgrade. Okay, great. I think we are running out of time actually. So, um, for questions, I've seen a lot, a lot more that have come in, but we will get back to you individually and give you responses on those. Um, so that is the upgrade mistakes portion of this session over. Um, if you'd like to stay online, I'm going to pass to Sue for a more detailed look at Insight now. Thanks, Amy. I just want to take a few moments and show you a demonstration of Insight software. And what Insight is, is a great reporting tool to help you with not only your financial reporting, but can also be useful as part of your upgrade to Release 12 and helping you look at values that existed in 11i and how those will be changing in Release 12 and also validating your data as it comes across. But right now, if we look at it from the financial reporting perspective, one of the important things within Insight is we actually have two types of users. We have a user we call a console user, which is a consumer of information. And then we have the report user who actually creates a lot of these reports. So those would be kind of power users in your finance department. So what I want to do is start out by showing you a quick overview of console, which again would be used by someone like a budget manager, a director in a group somewhere that needs access to financial information. And this is the person who often calls someone up to say, give me a report, and then calls back to get the details. The idea with Insight Console is it gives the user the power to view the information themselves. So very quickly, I've come into a budget monitoring report I might run on a period basis to see what's happening. It's nicely formatted so I can see the information clearly. I'm looking at my period to date actuals against my budget. It includes a quick variance column and with a percentage, and then I can also see against my annual budget and what's happening. What I also quickly note is that I have some red numbers here, which is what we call conditional formatting that automatically highlights exceptions. So as opposed to an FSG that might be run where I'm looking through reams of paper, in this case I'm able to quickly highlight and note what's happened. And then I can drill down immediately to find out what's going on. So in this case, I might want to know, well, what department is actually causing the spend overrun to occur? I've come in and I've been able to drill down and immediately I can see that my facilities resources group is actually causing the success. So again, I might want to drill back down to get some more detail about the transactions that are causing this overrun. Again, I can quickly and easily drill. In this case, I can see it's coming from payables 
and it is a rent expense. So again, I'm going to continue to drill down to see the information. I'm now going into accounts payable, and I can actually drill to see the invoices that are coming through. So again, these are all the kinds of questions that normally would go back and forth between a, finance, a budget manager and then back to finance or accounting to get these details. In this case, as the budget manager, I look and I can see that there are some invoices that are around 5700 that seems right, but then there's a large invoice, which is what's throwing me through a loop. Again, I can drill directly into invoices and payments. So on the top, you might note I was in general ledger. Now I'm drilling directly across the AP. And all along, variables on the top and filters have been passed to, to drill down that information and make it specific for what I want. However, one of the nice things about Insight is I have the ability to at any time always interact with this data and make changes. So in this case, I can see that Bank of America is the, is the supplier for this invoice, but I might want to know, instead of just knowing if this is a, an outlier, I might want to know what kind of invoices Bank of America is normally sending me. So in this case, I'm going to just change the vendor or put in the vendor Bank of America. I'm going to remove the invoice number so I can see all invoices. And I want to actually look for that period range for the whole year. So I want to look for invoices starting in January 2008, because that's the period of time I was looking for, through June 2008. So I'll come over here, select my invoices, my invoice range, come and rerun my report. And now I can actually see that these invoices you know, have been coming in every month. So perhaps it's just a coding issue. Perhaps I need to go back, change the coding of the invoice, or if it's already been paid, go back and do a journal transaction uh, to reverse that journal and fix it. But this is a good example of how an end user, a, a consumer of information, can actually find out the information for themselves. So the idea is that you're making the people in your department more self-sufficient and leaving the people in finance actually more time to get the information out to them and then focus on things that are more important, like doing your month in closing or getting information for your auditors. So now that we've taken a look at the console tool, what I want to do is show you our reporting tool and how this can actually be useful during your Release 12 upgrade. So I'm going to leave my console and go into our reporting tool. I'm going to log in as a reporting user. When I go in and select it, the first thing that will come up is for me to enter in my username and password. This is the same username that's coming in from Oracle. So what happens is I choose which of my Oracle users will have access to Insight, and that's part of the standard setup process. Another thing that's really key and quite useful for your Release 12 upgrade is you can see that with a single version of Insight, you can actually point to multiple instances of Oracle. So you could point to your existing 11R instance, you could point to a Release 12 test instance, and even uh, multiple test instances if those are going on while you're testing different bits of functionality. And the idea with this is that you can go ahead and run different reports and compare the data that's coming between the two. I'm also selecting my responsibility from Oracle, and this includes all of the security that I have um, in terms of access to information, what ledgers I can see, and any additional security that's been defined as part of this. When a user comes into Insight, they have the ability to create a report based on any templates that exist within Insight. And we look at general ledger, projects, accounts receivable, accounts payable, purchasing, and fixed assets. What we do with our templates is we automatically join information and bring information that we think will be valid and important to you. For anything that you have, you can come and run the data. This is just straight out of the box. And it will bring back, in this case, 249 rows with 0.84 seconds of time, so you always know how much data is being brought back and how quickly it takes. In this case, I've got a trial balance coming to zero, which is always good. For anything in Insight, though, you're always moving and interacting with your data. So in this case, let's put it to a period where I actually know I've got some good valid data that I have. I can go through and choose things like what department do I actually want to use. So I can select single departments, or I can choose ranges of departments. This is something that's really nice and is more difficult to do in Oracle when you run your information. Now I'm seeing information just based on the departments that I want. I can also do things like put in um, different accounts. I could put in account ranges. So I could say my revenue accounts are 4000 to 4999 
and maybe I want to do anything greater than 7,000, which are my expense accounts. Again, I can run this information, and I've seen um, my information as it's consolidated and comes through. These departments don't seem to have that, so let me move back, and again, move with my data. So again, you're always able to go in and just quickly make changes to see what you want. For anything that exists, you can always still go through and drill down and see those links and where the data comes from. So in this case, I'm able to see rent expenses are coming through. I'm able to go through and actually drill into the transactions in AP. These are actually just all information that's straight out of the box with Insight that you get. Another nice thing about it is whenever you want to go in and look at more information, I can see the, what's already come through. My department has come through. My account has come through. The column headers are here. What you have the ability to do and the real strength is being able to manipulate that and change it right away. Over here on the right-hand side are all of my columns that are displayed. On the left-hand side is additional information I might want to bring through. And then we also have the ability, let's bring over vendor name, I know what that is, um, is to look at the more columns. And this is really where a lot of the power of insight comes through. What we've done with our templates is we've brought in data from multiple applications. So I've got accounts payable, I've got who's created this transaction, I've got general ledger, I even have some inventory, some HR, and some purchasing information that's come through, as well as SLA information, which will be new in Release 12, and Release 12 hasn't really brought along any new SLA reports that exist, so here at Insight, we've got a way that you can actually access those right away. So as you can see, I can easily take information, say I wanted that created by username, select that transaction, let's take my created by and bring it across, bring it back up to the top, uh, next to the invoice here, select OK, rerun my report, oh, and now my information has come through. So again, you're just easily able to go through and interact with that data at any point that you want. So that's just an example of some general ledger reports that exist. Another thing you can do with an insight is actually create something called report paths. Report paths allow you to easily and quickly get groups of information and run them. So for example, I've got a procurement report pack here. So there might be a series of monthly reports or asset reports that you want to have available to people. Again, these could be available for console users. And the idea here is that there are reports that have been put together, and someone might just run them and look at them on a regular basis. So in this example, I've got send by category. So my user can come in and look at category send, um, the amount that's gone through that's been ordered. I also might be able to look at top 10 purchase orders that exist. And notice we do have some charting and graphing options. So for some people, pretty pictures work well. In this case, I'm just seeing my purchase order numbers. A big little request that we often get is uninvoiced receipts. And so people want to know what's actually been received and delivered in my organization, but I haven't actually been invoiced for it yet. That can be a big issue with accruals here. And one thing I haven't even shown yet is every time you have something that you create an insight, you can actually pop it straight out to Excel, and all of your formatting and information comes with you, so you have it right here or you can take it and send it out to PDF. So if I look in this example, invoices by category and run it, I could come over here and print to PDF as this comes through. So while we look at information and insight, it's always real time. You're not seeing anything static until you actually send it out into a report that you might need to send offline to people for whatever reason. We actually have one customer that does all of their boardroom reporting using Insight for that. So this has just been a really quick overview of some examples of things you can do with Insight reporting, how it can be useful, and how you can use it in your upgrade to release well. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Sue. That just about concludes the session for today. Um, the recording will be sent to everyone that's registered for the session later on this week. If you do have any other questions, then please do feel free to email us at info at insightsoftware.com. So a big, big thank you to Mike and Sue for presenting today. And a huge thank you to everyone that's joined us on this webinar. Thank you and look forward to speaking to you again soon.